Hey there! Look who's look who's on my screen. Hey, hey long time Great no see, you guys. I know it's been a while, eh? Well, it's been a while for every Canadian trying to go to the states and every American trying to come to Canada, right? That's the truth. That's the truth. You you know, I I mean, along with you guys, I have so many friends in Canada, and uh, you know, I'm often over there. I don't know, three four times a year teaching or doing something in a, with a festival. And oh, it's just killing me not to be able to come over and and see all my Canadian brothers and sisters over there. Well, we're stockpiling the maple syrup for you, so don't worry. All right. Well, you know, we got good maple syrup here in Michigan. I've heard that, yes. Yeah. You know what I'm really missing though is when Margaret would make that beautifully hand cranked coffee beans and make like uh, a uh, little coffee or cappuccino in the morning. Yes. Yes, that it's called a Bialetti. That's the name of the machine. Right. I've got a little one. Of, I've got a little one of the, you mean the little uh, thing you use to do the espresso? Yeah. 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 I got a small one that I got hooked on after I, you know, we've been to Italy quite a few times visiting our adopted family over there. So, uh, yeah, it takes a lot of time, but it's worth it. Yeah. Just like a lot of things in life. Yeah. 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 I guess. So uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Tony and Margaret are the producers, directors, editors, uh, chief cooks and bottle washers of Mighty Uke, the amazing story of, I always get it mixed up, <laughs> of a musical underdog. Or wait, the amazing comeback of a musical underdog. Yeah. That's what it is. And everybody just calls it the Mighty Uke yes. documentary. And uh, one of the things I like to talk about this morning is, you know, Mighty Uke Day is 10 years old, which is pretty, pretty amazing because um, the quick history of it is Tony and Margaret came out with their movie, was it in 2010 or? That's right, yeah. 2010. So Tony put out this thing, hey everybody, um, you know, we got this new movie about the ukulele, we'd like to get out and do some showings and that. And so I emailed him right back and we had just started up the Lansing Area Ukulele Group in 2009. Of course, we have Elderly Instruments, which is a great musical store. And I thought I'd, I'd do a little, uh, not even really a festival, just like a little party around the showing of the movie. So I emailed Tony and he goes, well, you know, we're working on the schedule. I'll get back to you. And then I like emailed him again. Hey, we're working on the schedule. I'll get back to you. <laughs> then I think it was like, I think he gave me about four weeks notice and said, hey, we're coming. <laughs> We'd like to come in on this day. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. And so what we did is we uh, put together a showing of the movie in uh, what's now the MICA Art Gallery. Right. We had to tape up all the windows so it was dark in there. We showed the movie and we had a little strum at Sir Pizza and uh, the Fabulous Heptones played. I think Rachel Davis played. Um, ukulele kings were we even a band then i'm not sure um but we had fun it was like a glorified open mic hmm. and i was like wow this thing went really well and then everybody was coming up and he goes this was great what are we going to do next year and i'm like next year uh well i guess we'll figure out something <laughs> so it, it started uh this tradition and uh I don't, I don't know if you guys had ever been to Lansing before. Oh, gosh, no. And we were so surprised and impressed, especially with the old town, because I think probably like many ukulele players, as well as loving to play music, there's this love of music history, of, of nostalgia in general, right? Absolutely. And, you know, you picked a perfect spot. Old town Lansing is such a great place. There's such a great vibe. There's a ukulele vibe. <laughs> there right? is. I mean, it's got character and it's a great place for a bunch of characters to come visit. <laughs> you know, that's right. And it's so, uh, it's well, all gotten nicer over the years. I mean, you've been back a couple times, but not for not for a few, yeah, not for a while. Yeah, Since while we've been we were working on miniature, yeah, yeah, we made another documentary subsequently, which really took us more towards Europe than towards uh, the U.S. Um, but uh, the I think we were maybe there were were there for the first four. Might have been something. Yeah, like first that. three or four. Yeah. Maybe. yeah. That, yeah. The big thing I always, other than, you know, I, I always, like I said, I always blame you guys for Mighty Youth Day. 
Because <laughs> without the movie, I don't know if this ever would have happened, really. And well, uh, Play Street, because without you, you know, we've shown that movie in a lot of different places, and a ukulele festival has not sprung up in each one. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Right. No, that's true. That's true. That's right. All the more than you might think. Yes. Uh, Clubs, yes. You know, I mean, for us, there is no higher accolade, seriously, that we could hope for than to leave a trail mm. of wonderful, intimate music festivals, you know? Sure. And, and they popped up, you know, Mighty Ute Day has been going for 10 years. There's stuff happening in Italy. Well, you know, you know, there's a whole network now of, of like-minded ukulele players who are creating a global circuit, right? Yep, yep. And hopefully we can all travel to all these wonderful places again. Oh, well, we will. We will. And it I will think be a party. Will. It will be a party the next it will. Years. It will be. It'll have to be a controlled party at first. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Indeed. But uh, yeah, I mean, especially, it, you know, you're, uh, well, first, let me, you guys not only uh, were a big part in getting Mighty Youth Day started, obviously, because we, we based the first event around the movie, but you were a big step in, big, uh, step in bringing us to that next step. Um, and Mighty Ute Day 3, you know, we had grown, Mighty Ute Day 2, we brought in over Little Rev, who's great, you know, and, but he's right across the pond, the uh, Lake Michigan pond. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, it, it wasn't quite as big of a risk. And then in Mighty Ute Day 3, I was at, I was trying to get somebody to come and perform and it wasn't working out. And Tony goes, well, you want me to get a hold of James Hill for you? <laughs> I was like, whoa, how, how, James Hill, Hill, how could we ever have him in our little funny little festival? And sure enough, uh, you put us together and uh, that was the first year we did uh, two nights of concerts. We had Danielle ate the sandwich on that Friday night. Right. And the whole, I was really nervous because there are guarantees of money <laughs> and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And believe it or not, being the ukulele, Ambassador of Michigan is not the most lucrative job in the world. Really? Yeah. It may surprise you, but <laughs> you know, I, I want to put all those rumors to rest. Yes. But no Swiss bank accounts or Chinese bank accounts or whatever. <laughs> but uh, um, <laughs> it went well. Everything went well. And that was actually the first year that we had some money left over. And that's when we got Music as the Foundation started yeah. to uh, help promote all these and support program ukulele programs in Michigan classrooms and communities. So it's just gone up, kept going on from there. Yeah. And uh, well, and also Ben, uh, yeah. as a result of, I don't know which one it was, but one of the Mighty Ute days, some folks came down from Traverse City and they either heard about the movie, saw the movie, knew about Mighty Ute Day, I can't yeah. remember. But they ended up inviting us to Traverse City to do a show which is a beautiful screen, place. Which was a great event, the ma magnificent theater that Michael Moore renovated yep. in Chicago City. And there was such a great community of like-minded uh, musicians there. Yeah. And I think you now have also developed a, a, a relationship hooked up and it's helped to spread the uke through Michigan. Right, right. Yeah, we, you know, Michigan, I call it the great uke state <laughs> because we have we've got like over 30 ukulele groups across the state, including two or three up in the Upper Peninsula. Wow. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, people are surprised when I tell them that. It's like, oh yeah, California, we've got all these groups in Florida. And I go, you know, Michigan has like 30 ukulele groups, some big, some small, but uh, really, and they all support each other and drive around at least they used to drive around <laughs> next year we'll drive around from club to club but uh um you know yeah it's it's real i think the ukulele community as a whole is pretty special yeah and i think you guys probably discovered that when you were making the mighty youth documentary that was the nicest yeah. surprise the surprise i think was the community yeah the um you know andy andrews right uh he's yeah. in the film santa cruz ukulele club the kind yeah. of the the Mecca, I guess, maybe. <laughs> um, uh, he said once that, uh, you know, the ukulele is a portal, and but it only lets certain people through. <laughs> <laughs> well, people have to be open to it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, it, it's, 
it's funny, I think in a lot of people's mind, the ukulele is this, you know? Yeah. And when you get in the middle of it, the ukulele is this, you know? Yeah. There's all kinds of people and all kinds of music and all kinds of characters. And uh, I think a lot of people just have those blinders on it. Well, I don't like ukulele music, you know? And it's like, yeah. well, what is ukulele music? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's just yeah, music. We, yeah, yeah, we've talked about that, how, you know, you go to a blues festival and you've got four days of blues. You go to a jazz festival, you got four days of jazz. Go to Mighty Ute Day, you hear jazz, you hear blues, you hear funk, you hear avant-garde, you hear old-timey music. Uh, and that's really wonderful because yeah. Uh, it's like we're not musical tribes. It's very inclusive. Uh, yep. you, can, you can be a fan of ukulele funk and also be a fan of Tiny Tim. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's, nice. yeah, it's, it's I think Rhea and I have talked about like all the amazing people we've met through the ukulele community, whether they're, you know, our wonderful artists that we bring in or, you know, the people in our ukulele group or my seniors group or, you know, there's not all this, I don't know, bashing of heads and egos and this and that, you know. Um, it, might have, it might have something to do, Ben, with that breadth of music so that, you know, when, at a blues festival, everybody's trying to nail, you know, the essence of the blues. So they're all competing, right? Sure. Or, and then that might be a little harsh to put it that way. But, you know, in no way really is James Hill playing in the same musical arena as Little Rev. There's crossover, right. but they're on their own journeys. And, Absolutely. and, and that, that is rich. It's a rich, uh, it'd be nice if there were like music festivals where you could hear a great blues guy and then a great jazz band and then a great, you know, but you don't really that much. Yeah, you? not that there's some that kind of go that way a little bit, but I don't think, I, I, that's a good point, Tony. I hadn't really thought of it that way before, but. Yeah. It's a it's a broad community, a broad scope of music, yes. a broad scope of people um, and different interests. And one other biggie, uh, I think. Well, of course you know because you worked there for a long time. Uh, elderly, absolutely. Uh, elderly be a part of this old town, mighty Ute day. It just really uh, it it brings a musical heavyweight to the table, which is so cool. Yep. It matters a lot having decent ukuleles to play, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The first challenge, right, was to find a ukulele, and I had to go all the way across town <laughs> in Toronto. Back, she, so she bought me a uke way back in what, like two thousand and five, maybe somewhere around there. Ago. Yeah, and you know, it was impossible to get one. Now, of course, the largest music re retailer in Canada is is chock full of them. But back right. then, you couldn't even go in. You couldn't find a ukulele. Right. Right. In Canada, it's called Long and McQuaid's. That's our yeah. big. Yeah, yeah, it's a chain. Uh, you couldn't. You couldn't. Yeah. So that's well, so. So, what got you guys started on the idea of the Mighty You movie? Oh wow! Oh, the uh, movie. Well, you, you inherited Tony inherited an unplayable you that had sentimental value, mm -hmm. and uh, and I would watch him he'd pick up this ukulele. He had it hung on the wall. He'd pick it up, and the strings would have lost their tuning, and he'd swear <laughs> and be really. I could see he was disappointed. He wanted to play that ukulele. So he had his <laughs> birthday coming up, and I went out. And the only ukulele you could buy in this city, probably in the country, was uh, one of those Martin Mexican ones. The um, right, yeah, there the it is. Sopranos, yeah. So I bought that ukulele, and then uh, it, as we often did, we would go to jams, and, uh, and people would play the ukulele, and there seemed to be a different spirit. It seemed to be that there was less ego, and people would play it, and they would go, well, you know, this is really fun. I haven't had this much fun playing in a really long time. So it was that that put the notion in our mind of a movie. That, they, that, that there was a spirit in the instrument that was different from the other uh, instruments that were being played at jams. Yes. Now, now, what had happened previously is there had been some other films made about the ukulele. Yeah. Uh, some, you know, varying degrees of quality going all the way back to Tiny Tim on Laughing, right? Um, uh, but what I think what we decided was that this was a serious topic. This wasn't goofy or silly or weird or eccentric. And some of the short films we'd seen about the ukulele back, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, it was about, you know, strange people doing strange things on this weird little instrument. Further right. marginalizing it. Further marginalizing <laughs> it. Right, right. 
And, and we saw, you know, we saw Paul McCartney play something on the ukulele at the concert for George. We heard Israel Kamaka Viva Ole play, you know, uh, wonderful. Uh, wonderful Life. Uh, and, and then we started looking around and we saw beautiful songwriters, uh, awesome songwriters like Victoria Vox and, and Little Rev doing a, a you know, a, a, an ode to uh, American musical history to Tin Pan sure. And it became pretty clear that uh, this was not a silly, weird little instrument. We had been conditioned to believe that way. Maybe it was the Tiny Tim effect, I don't know. But uh, it's pretty clear today that the ukulele can save your life. <laughs> well, you know, it, it really can. <laughs> I think it saved a lot of people's at least sanity this year. Yeah. For sure. You know, well, I mean, I, I've people. been so impressed with uh, how many, you know, I teach a, a big seniors group um, in East Lansing, the prime, uh, prime, we call them the prime time strummers. It's East Lansing <laughs> prime time nice. um, group. And I am blown away by how many people who never would have gotten into all this technology and stuff before have really embraced um, Zoom meetings, we do a big group that's, it's about 35, 40 people. I've got a lesson this morning, actually. And, uh, but how many of them have taken off into their own little subgroups, taken the initiative and go, well, I wanna play more ukulele. Or they've gotten, um, you know, without uh, having, going to work and all this stuff as much, traveling as much, they've really uh, dug into all the great uh, workshops and things that have been offered online, like. Greg Chi and Ukuleni and all these different people. And uh, I, I really think it has helped people survive, certainly um, mentally and emotionally during this past year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we interviewed a lot of people who'd had uh, significant health benefits. One person cured her bursitis. Uh, somebody else had quit yeah. smoking. And, and, uh, so we were beginning to work this into the, the movie and our notion about how it was going to go. And that's what made me start playing. Because when we started filming, I hadn't taken up the ukulele and I, I didn't really play much of any instrument except percussion. And, uh, and so I, I started thinking, we're kind of offering a prescription of ukulele for better health. If I don't take that, I'm missing an awfully big opportunity. I'm not taking my own advice. So that's how yeah, I right. ended up in a play in the first place is all these people were saying it's made me healthier. It's helped me feel yeah, better. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I've, I've found working, I mean, with children and seniors, uh, just for children starting to get that dexterity together, working yes. together as a group um, for my adults who, you know, as we all get older, we, our hands don't work quite as good as they used to and this and that. It really helps getting them loosened up yep. and you know, doing some exercising of some fingers you might not use otherwise. And, that, and now that we're uh, you know, all in uh, quarantine, uh, right. we're using our fingers even more, right? <laughs> I, know. I know. In fact, I think the other day I was setting up the, the Cyber Mud website, you know, our online uh, Mighty Youth Day 10 we're gonna do and uh, God, I got home and I'm telling Rhea, I go, my hand is just killing me, you know? And she goes, you've just been typing way too much. Yeah. For me, it's yeah. mouse fatigue. Remember? I know. Mouse well, you know, when I first started using a mouse at Elderly Instruments, when I was helping lay out the catalog, first time, you know, really using a computer, I went directly to my left hand instead of my right hand. Right. Um, just kind of to get my brain working a little better. Um, I don't know. So, so Ben, uh, you know, we're documentary filmmakers, so we're used to asking the questions. Oh. Uh, so I think I might have a few questions for you, okay? Okay. So, you know, when we first, when we did Mighty You Day One, it was new for everybody involved, and it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think, were you even teaching the ukulele then? Not not teaching per se, I'd been leading the laugh group, right, which I right. always incorporate some right. education through it. Being a teacher, it's hard not to. 
Yeah. Right, Margaret? So what, what, is, what has happened for you with the ukulele since Mighty Ute Day One? What, is, what, what has it brought to your musical experience? What do you do now that you didn't do 10 years ago? Well, you know, when I, I, I've played guitar since I was a teenager, you know, I started out playing piano. And of course, when I was a teenager, I decided, well, I'm going to play electric guitar, of course, right? And uh, so when I picked up the ukulele, when I first got exposed to the ukulele, really in 2009, when I, uh, I discovered it at the uh, uh, Ukulele Festival Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, Roy Sakuma's festival, and uh, I got hooked on it. We started the laugh group. And as that went on, I think I found that, you know, a lot of people wanted to do more than just strum and sing. And I think I wanted to do more than that too. What I loved about the ukulele was, you know, there were a lot of chords I could play on the ukulele that I always had trouble with on guitar, like diminished chords and stuff like that. All these weird major sevenths and, yeah. and stuff. So I think, uh, I think it really helped me expand my songwriting. Yeah. Because everything wasn't, you know, a three chord, four chord song. A, new path. Are, a lot are, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, it did allow me to do some different things. And uh, trying to think how I actually got into the teaching. You know, I was working at the English language school. Right. And we started a Ukulele International Orchestra there, which mm -hmm. was wonderful. It was all these people from all over the world getting together and playing music and singing in English, which really helped reinforce that. And then I think, I think it's really when I went to East Lansing primetime, right. however long ago, eight years ago or so, and uh, approached them with the idea of doing an ukulele class. And we started out with a handful of people there, uh, some of who are still in the group today. And I think we started out with about eight people. Uh, I was able to loan, uh, line up some ukuleles for the program and uh, people could check them out because they maybe they didn't even have an ukulele then they were just interested in it and now that group's like I said like 40 people oh, nice nice you know and like I said some of us have been playing together forever and ever so um, I think I think what it's brought to me is uh, more of a musical awareness um, I've been trying to dig a little bit more into theory and things like that. We've been doing some events with uh, Peter, uh, Peter Luongo here in Michigan. And of course, I've, you know, done some stuff with James, both of those two, I mean, come from the same, same background somewhat. And uh, uh, so I've been digging into that. But I, I think what has brought me the most is just that sense of community. You know, I always like to say the ukulele is the most folk of folk instruments because it brings folks together. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, true, true. it's it's really true. And people just, I like I said, I've just met the nicest people. Yeah. Through this well, crazy little. You know instrument. What? I think the other interesting thing, and I don't know why this is, but I'm glad it is this way, is there are no uh, ukulele pop stars. You know what I mean? Like, of course, there are some amazingly talented and successful working musicians who primarily play on the ukulele. But there's no, you know, Madonna on the ukulele or Bruno Mars on the ukulele. That It's still a people-sized, it's a people-sized, I don't want to say industry, but whatever yeah. we want to call it. Uh, like, you know, there aren't a lot of uh, tour managers or roadies or... Mm -hmm. You know, there's, it's just, it's just the musicians in the audience for the most part, right? Yeah. Well, it's uh, more relatable that way, I think. You know, like you, you join a rock band and you go on tour and it's a cast of thousands and, right. you know, you never meet the audience or if you do, it's, uh, you know, some kind of radio station, stage, whatever it is, you know, but that the uke has managed like itself to be small people sized international community. So... Mm -hmm. That's amazing, right? Like you said, people in Italy that you know, and there's people in Japan and, and yeah. we're all, we're, you know, often many of us have another job or uh, another way to make a living so that the music part is for the music. Right, or they, they found other, other avenues of using music to make a living too. Right. 
Right. Um, I mean, James and Ann are a great example of that. Um, I mean, I think quite a while ago, they had this vision that, you know, we're just not going to want to be touring all the time. And then they put together this whole program, um, you know, which has the heritage of Doan and uh, Luongo. And, you know, um, it was taking that Canadian ukulele uh, educational aspect of it to another level and different technology and, and other things like that. So it all boils down to the ukulele leaves space. The short sustain means that there's a lot of space. And I think that that attracts a certain kind of person who's comfortable leaving space for others. Yeah. And also um, the, the, the quietness of it. So it's, it tends not to be, you know, it, this is acoustic, acoustic ukulele, not an instrument that projects a lot. So it doesn't attract the big egos, I think. And it attracts the, the, the sharing type, the sharing minded folks yeah. who are okay to leave a little bit of space open for somebody else to jump in and share. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good point. And I like the way that, like when you have a group together, how d people at all different levels can, can play together and help each other out and things like that, you know? Um, I always say, like when I do these ukulele festivals, I'm like, man, if I, and everybody's like jamming at night and doing stuff. And of course, some people, they're playing some cool little licks, but they're never like trying to take over the show, you know? <laughs> I'm always like, well, if we had like a big guitar thing like this, everybody would be trying to outdo each other every minute, you know? All you have to do is walk into the local music store on a Saturday afternoon. And oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Yeah, you go to elderly back in the electric guitar room, which, oh, you know, and then you're in the ukulele room and everybody's like, oh, that's cool. What are you doing <laughs> there? Oh, you know? to contain the guitar guys. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. you don't need that. It's true. And I love electric guitar. But, you know, it, it, it is kind of interesting, the different mindset of that. So Mighty, the Mighty movie now is 10. 10. Yeah, wow. yeah, 10 years old. Yeah, isn't that crazy? We almost got a teenager on her. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, then you're you know trouble. what? We, we still sell T-shirts and DVDs around the world. You know, I mean, no one's getting rich, but it's great yeah. that new people continue to discover you know, wherever it is in the States, in Australia, in Japan. Um, I, I'll tell you an interesting story. A friend of mine um, who I went to high school with in Toronto, uh, we played in a band together back in the day. But after high school, he moved to Japan and he lives in Tokyo and he makes a good living as a jazz guitarist. But when we reconnected about 10 years ago, I told him about Mighty Uke and he watched it and he loved it. And he immediately went out and bought six ukuleles. <laughs> That's, <And> <laughs> That's the way you do it. Yeah. And he started a ukulele group called Toalele. And, uh, and, you know, it's a going concern for him. So it's been really sweet to not only reconnect with an old high school friend, but to have this thing happen in Tokyo, of all places. Uh, it's neat. It's and and you. I'm sure you've experienced the same thing over and over again. It's like this little seed gets planted, and Absolutely. then before you know it, there's a hedge. You know, it's amazing. Well, that's what happened here in Michigan. I mean, I really think the Lansing Area Ukulele Group has been an incubator for right. other groups. You know, when we started, uh, Tree Town Uxie Ann Arbor Group was a, uh, you know, had already been established, um, and then we came along and kind of. Um, you know, blew it up somewhat. I mean, we, what, what was that show? There was a PBS show that yeah, uh, under the radar. Yeah, that they, that, that they interviewed us at thought, right? Mighty Uke Day four or something. It's on the. It's actually on the Mighty Uke Day website. Oh okay. Um, oh, and he, yeah, that was a great. He's a great, great interviewer too. He's a lot of fun. Yeah, and I imagine that there were people all over Michigan who tuned into that thing and went. Yeah, I want in on that. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, before I forget, there's something I really have to uh, have to give Margaret all, all my appreciation for is she named our cat. <laughs> <laughs> when they were here, when Tony and Margaret were here for Mighty Youth Day 3, uh, Rhea and I had just found this cat out in the out in the barn, and it was, had been abandoned by its mother, and uh, we were bottle feeding it, and uh, 
you know, when they're that young, you can't really sex them. You know, we didn't know if it was a male or a female. And Margaret, Tony and Margaret, you guys were staying there. I think you slept on the futon in the living room or something. And uh, Margaret, well, you know, so we were trying to come up with a name that didn't have a gender connotation to it. And uh, Margaret goes, well, why don't you name it Silo since you found it in the barn? So sure enough, Silo's still around. Right She's on. a sassy, what was that? Seven, eight-year-old cat now. And uh, we've got some great pictures of her about yes. this big, <laughs> like coming onto my face. Oh yeah. <laughs> There's one of her like biting my nose, you know. <laughs> yeah, she's quite a little character. Oh, that's nice. that was one cute that's kid. Nice. So I know you you've had a couple projects you've been working on. And uh um why don't you tell us first a little bit about miniatures? Now I know that was a documentary and now it's like a Mini series or something. Mini series, I know. So uh, after uh, Mighty Uke, uh, which took us around the world and introduced us to so many fantastic people, um, you know, how are you going to top that? Well, the only way you can top it is really to get smaller. Uh, <laughs> well, no, that's not true. Really, what we what we uh, decided was that we were going to make documentaries about what we like. Because if you're going to spend two years completely immersed. And as you mentioned earlier, we basically do it all ourselves. Sure. Um, and I work editing other people's documentaries and sometimes they're pretty dark subjects. I just like to be on the lighter side of life. Per, per, you know, so in the same way that Mighty Uke, uh, the ukulele opens up us to creative possibilities, so does the miniature. And we began making a film that uh, is similar to Mighty Uke in some ways in that we uh, traveled uh, to many different places to interview people who are passionate about miniatures for a variety of reasons. And it ended up being a, a lovely little documentary um, similar to Mighty Uke in some ways, except that the miniature is, is more of a solitary endeavor as opposed to a group endeavor. Not and by, not, yeah, and by not, miniatures, <laughs> what kinds of things are you talking about? Uh, okay, so we're talking about, uh, now we did the whole history of miniature art. Uh, so I guess mostly it's miniature art, uh, you know, like... Um, Starting 40,000 years ago with the earliest art of all, all art, those tiny uh, mammoth ivory carvings, there's a, or there's a stone blue horse. There's a lot of those around the Danube in, in Germany. Okay. So it's the oldest art in the world, miniatures. Hmm. You know, you've got a lot of... Uh, female figurines and animals. And um, so we start there with the oldest art and then kind of move forward around Europe and North America. So what other art? Well, no. hang on, let's go, let's go switch tacks a little bit because, you know, why? Why would we make a movie about miniatures? And there are a couple of things that come to very quickly. Um, Comprehend is the French word for understanding, but comprehend means to take in hand. And in some ways, when we try to grasp something, try to understand it, often we make a miniature of it first. When, you know, the American Air Force designs a new fighter jet, they make a miniature of it first. Sure. When someone, when an architect is gonna build, you know, the tallest skyscraper in the world, they make a miniature of it first. The miniature allows us to gain uh, new, rich, and interesting perspectives on things that we would take for granted. So even one, there's one fellow in the movie who says, look at this miniature chair. It's just a miniature chair. But I think about what is this chair? What does it do in a way that I don't with the real chair? I just sit in it. And that's right, kind of right, what right. the movie is about. It's this notion of taking a look. It's a, it's a different perspective on the reality that we live in, the miniature and, and uh, that's the philosophical thing. The, the, the actual manifestation is, you know, kids learn gender roles playing with miniatures. Um, for better and for worse. Education, uh, miniatures are used in all kinds of educational of course, yeah. purposes. So, so that was the idea. Between taking in something in an Eiffel and walking around it, right? So in, in one eyeful, you have sort of the ability to comprehend something. And so that's why we miniaturize in order to comprehend. Right, so, yeah. yeah, you can so, take it all in. 
Yeah. So, on, so on we, um, we made the feature documentary and then um, we, we sold it to a Canadian broadcaster, but then the CBC came to us and said, we really like this project. Can you turn it into a multi-part series that we could run? And we had extra material, just like when we made Mighty Uke, we had sure. all those extras. So we put together this, uh, you know, a, a little mini series as it was. And, <laughs> And so that's playing right now up here. Um, I uh, subsequently, during this lockdown, I bought a model of the Starship Enterprise, which Whoa. I'm building right now. It's like I'm reliving a childhood, you know, because you probably, did you like Star Trek when you were a kid? Oh, of course. I still like it. <laughs> we we binge watched uh, Picard during the oh, right 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 the lockdown. But right. well, you, you know, that's interesting too. I mean, so many of us, you know, put together models, Yeah, you know, as kids. I mean, I remember I had a monkey mobile I put together. Yeah, I remember that model. Oh, that yeah. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I just never really thought of how many miniatures there are in our lives and just That's around right. us, you like, know. Even just look around in your room right now. Right. You'll probably find a handful of them. Yeah. So I got like, these little miniature cats over here i got when i was in china and uh i've got a miniature dog back here who's <laughs> sleeping hey, hey he's sleeping Little jack um, uh and then what was the last there was one last thing that i was going to say oh i know the, the pitch miniaturedoc.com visit miniaturedoc.com and <laughs> learn about the movie and also watch it if you want to cool let me i'll write that down miniaturedoc.com and it's not a small doctor you know, that's what, you, know, <laughs> you beat me to the joke there dude <laughs> and it's got three-dimensional illustrations this time instead of the, the pencil drawings oh yeah that's right. right that's right margaret uh, you remember last time the drawings the wonderful animated drawings well this time it's plasticine animation miniature plasticine wow animation. how cool like it's stop motion kind of stuff, or... it did. so it's kind of like the culmination and or Maybe the moment in which I made those many hours spent with plasticine as a kid into something potentially uh, yeah. useful. Wow. So they took that and they made it into a mini, a mini series. That's right. uh, so I'm hoping it gets like syndicated somehow. Like, uh, I mean, we've, we've had so much fun with, with Canadian shows such as Schitt's Creek. Oh yeah, we just, yeah, yeah, we're in the midst of the last season right now. What a yeah, we, we binge watch all of the seasons. <laughs> in, I think in March or a, March and April, you know. You know, oh, Catherine, it's awesome. O'Hara, Catherine O'Hara is a master. Is like yeah, she, oh, oh, she's amazing. Uh, and her and uh, Eugene Levy, you know, just okay. work together so much. So um, they have such a chemistry, and then bringing his son in there, and it was, it's a great cast. It's it's yeah, it's, it's a great show. So you've also done uh, some editing on a couple of projects. Um, you had Drive. That's what I really want to check oh, out. Oh, yeah, yeah. That'll be cool. And that hopefully, you know, uh, the director that I edited, edited the film with um, is hoping to get a U.S. sale. We all hope to get a U.S. sale. Uh, we'll see what happens. But that doc is about... Um, you know, there's there's a self-driving revolution coming, right? Right. We don't know when, but uh, but what will we lose? I you know, know driving know. is a, is an essential part of uh, at least the North American character. I I think it'd be safe to say, um, and so the film is a kind of uh, loving, nostalgic look at how much we get out of driving around in a self in our with our hands on the wheel. Absolutely. I mean, I, I've told you guys before, I love to drive, you know, and I was a sales rep for quite a few years. So I would drive 40, 50,000 miles a year. Yeah. And uh, it, it was just a place for me to clear my mind a lot of times. Yeah. Like I'd, I'd uh, come up with a bunch of song lyrics and then I, of course, scribble them down while I'm driving. And then I couldn't read them when I got home. Yes. But, uh, or, you know, you kind of solve the problems of the world. <laughs> You know, yeah. whatever. I mean, uh, I'll... Uh, well, you know, one of the biggies that I kind of learned while working on the film was uh, this one woman, uh, she was recounting how, as she was growing up, because she was one of many daughters, 
uh, her mom used to drive her to school. So they would have a half an hour every morning together, just the two yeah. of them. And, and she said, I could have conversations with her that I couldn't have anywhere else because Absolutely. we were moving in the same direction together. Often when we have conversations, if we're at a restaurant, we're facing each other. We're in essence coming like this. Yeah. We're having a conversation when both of you are going this way leads to different outcomes. Well, you know what's interesting? That makes remind my mom who died a couple of years ago. Um, she and I took a trip to Washington, D.C. to see some relatives. This was, I don't know how long ago, 30 years ago or something. And I had, uh, what was it? Must have been in the 70s. Um, that's more than 30 years ago, right? The, yeah. uh, <laughs> the 50. <laughs> the, uh, um, but we ha I had a Volkswagen Beetle and I was managing a, a car stereo store at the time. So I had this killer stereo in there. <laughs> grabbing equalizers and big speakers. And so I got the car, you know, and I turned up the radio and she like turned it off. She goes, we're not gonna listen to that all the way there. And I'm like, okay, mom. You know, we, but it was a 12, 14 hour drive to get to DC. And we were both hoarse by the time we got there because <laughs> we spent so much time talking right. and uh, which we never would have done if the car stereo was on. And, uh, I learned so much about her growing up and about our family and some dark secrets I never knew before. <laughs> and, you know, I was really, I'm going, really? I didn't know. Right, right. But I, I think you're right. It, it's, uh, um, you get together in a car and you're kind of just both right there. And the yeah. only thing you're focused on is going forward. Yeah. And uh, well, give me the to talk. You know, landscape is got passing by to stimulate conversation, stores and highways. Absolutely. Of food, you know. But more than anything, you've left the space so that there is the room to, to talk, to put the conversation into. The, the car isn't full of sound from elsewhere. Right, right. right. So like the ukulele. <laughs> so that was fun. And, and in fact, one of the neatest parts about that film was uh, he actually, the director, hired us to go to England oh, to film uh, uh, one of the stories. And one of the stories was about London cabbies and, you know, how they make a living driving and the threat that Uber has posed to them. Sure. So uh, we got to spend a few days with London cabbies and it was so much fun. Oh, my God. I bet. What characters. Oh, you know, speaking of cabs, the... Uh... Uh, this brings back to an ukulele experience. So when I was in, I was in China, I don't know, five, six years ago, and uh, basically working with a, a retired gentleman I had worked with here in Lansing. And uh, we, I kind of traveled around and kind of teaching English through ukulele, American culture through ukulele. And I was in a cab in uh, one of these, one of these cities you've never heard of that has 12 million people. Yeah. You know? And uh, <clears throat> we were driving and uh, <clears throat> I had my ukulele out <clears throat> and he goes, uh, he said, you are my sunshine. I go, yeah. So I was playing, you are my sunshine in the back seat. He was in the front seat singing along and he had his cell phone on so he could, his friend could hear. <laughs> <laughs> That is magic. That, that was awesome. I that love was it. awesome. But uh, um, well, I know you've you've been working on other projects. You had uh, the decoys one. That sounded pretty interesting. Oh yeah, yeah, that was fun. That was fun. Yeah, too. Yeah. yeah. There's lots keeping us busy. Although you know, it's been pretty quiet this year. Uh, but that's okay. Time to you know uh, re refuel the battery. I guess you know, like. Uh, uh, learn I, I i've been jokingly telling people like that this period of time is practice retirement yeah <laughs> it's important right because you know so many of us uh hit retirement and we don't know what to do and so this maybe for a lot of us will be that kind of oh okay i can start this hobby and maybe it will carry me maybe right. that's the, right. maybe that's right. the upside one more right? piece in the puzzle of um, life, of life. the puzzle of life Yes, yes. So in, in Toronto, I mean, how are, how are things going there with all this 
Um, I mean, uh, uh, it's both, if you walk downtown, certain parts of downtown, it doesn't look any different, but in other parts, it's quite different. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, we've been very lucky uh, to have um, uh, a government who understands the struggles that uh, uh, a lot of people are having, especially sure. freelancers, because yeah. uh, you know, freelancers often disappear through the cracks. Sure. So that's good. Uh, no live music. Um, that's the toughest part i think yeah yeah no live music and uh uh no large gatherings obviously um are but, things you know, like the market we, we get out we get out every morning for a two-hour walk before the sun comes up uh it's just a great way to start the day and keep it it's like we can do nothing the rest of the day and feel like <laughs> we've earned our day yeah well you know and, and you've got such a great neighborhood to get out and walk around because Depending which turn you take, it's like something totally it's different. It's yeah. true. Is that market still open that we would walk down yeah. to? Or? Yeah, yeah, it's still there. Uh, that place. Of course, great. you know, it's only one person in a shop at a time. <laughs> sure. thing, right? Well, uh, that's the same thing kind of here. You know, Rhea's done with the store and, right. um, you know, we've been really cautious with it and just let people in. The doors lock. So people yeah. ring a doorbell and they come in. They have to have a mask on. Yeah. Um, you know, we limit a, the amount of people, but yeah, I think we're all finding ways to make it work. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that comes back to me thinking how this ukulele community <clears throat> in the absence of big in-person festivals and concerts and that, um, we found a way to make it work. And I think ukulele people in particular are creative bunch and, uh, they're used to kind of swimming upstream a little bit sometimes in this great big world. And, uh, yeah. yeah, now, you know, Cyber Mud X is going to be a little different, but yep. Mighty Youth Day 11, whoo-wee! Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I can't wait. We'll, uh, I think we'll, uh, I don't think it'll happen in person in May as usual, right. but hopefully we can do something in the fall altogether. You never know, right? I mean, you just... You know, know that's what's hard to plan. Yeah. You know, yeah. I tell people, I, I tell people sometimes, well, you know, I'm a planner. And I'm a little bit of a control freak, you know, when it comes to this, I go, yeah, it's hard time. and it's hard to plan anything when you don't have any control over it, you know, so, but, you know, I, I've, I've been heartened by the way, everybody's just embraced getting together, however they can right now. Yeah, we'd rather be together in person, of course, but, um, and with Cyber Mud X, <laughs> Mighty U Day 10, we've, uh, you know, we've tried as best we can to have some of the things that make yeah, have made Mighty UK special with the open mic and the featured performers and um, some different things like that. So we're going to make it work. Nice. And it's I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And I, you know, truly want to thank you guys for helping get this started and just being such good friends. Hey, oh, and thank ditto, you. Yeah, yeah. ditto right back at you. And now I will send my lovely uh, upstairs. She's got to go teach. We've got our 60 virtual students. Uh, <laughs> They're adorable. They're yeah, absolutely What adorable. grades? I, I've got all nine this semester. And I think that's, if you're going to teach online school, that's a great age group to teach. Yeah. In high school, it's all new. They're very excited. Well, they're savvy enough with the technology and they're not too jaded about everything yet. So they're not right. too jaded. <laughs> yes. And if they are, then I will work it into the curriculum. Of course, of course. Yeah. Well, you guys take care of yourselves. It's great talking to you. I mean, I've really missed this and I can't yes. wait to cross that blue water bridge yeah. and yeah. get back to Toronto one of these. And send our love to Rhea and Silo too. Oh, yeah. we'll do. We'll do. I'll have Silo nip me just and Oh. Pass it along to Tony there. So. <laughs> and uh, okay, so uh, greetings from us to the Old Town General Store, to Sir Pizza, mm -hmm. and to Elderly. Please yeah. stand, stand for us. It's uh, uh, he, it's such a great thing he's got going. Oh, great! Well, I look forward to seeing you guys in person again Always. when we can. So twenty twenty one. Fingers All crossed. right. Take care. <laughs> Happy Cyber Month ten. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. 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 Take care.